Welcome back to the swamp my friends and welcome if you're new. Today I'm going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true cryptid encounter horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit yours at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. Be sure to hit that like button, subscribe if you're new, and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new episode. I upload them Monday through Friday on all things natural and supernatural. Now, without further ado, let's jump right into these creepy and downright strange cryptid encounter horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. Before I share this story, there is something you must know. A premonition is a vision or a dream about the future. In my family, premonitions are common. Most notably, when my father was 12 years old, he had a dream about a large lady in a round, brimmed hat wearing a floral dress. He believed it was a sign from God that this person would be necessary in his life. Years later, in his 20s, my father moved into a house some church members ran as an Airbnb. To cut a long story short, the lady from his dream owned the house. The house is also where he met my mother for the first time. Now I am no stranger to premonitions. I've had dreams about the future that end up coming true. I consider this to be God telling me it will be alright. However, this dream or premonition, whatever you want to call it, was the most confusing, grisly, scary, and bone-chilling thing I've ever experienced. And I kid you not, this is 100% true through and through. I remember that this experience happened years ago and I just found out about your channel a few months ago. So if some things don't make sense, I apologize in advance. Anyway, my dream started when I was six years old. My father and I were in a car I didn't recognize. I later found out the car was a custom Toyota Prado with a bull bar and a snorkel. These details will be necessary, so try to remember that. We were driving to my grandmother's house in Canberra. To get there, we would have to journey down the highway through seemingly endless bands of Australian bush and farmland surrounding us. In the dream, my phone, which I didn't even own at the time, had recently died. So, I decided to look out the window to pass the time. With that, I saw a vast, gnarly looking cat keeping pace with the car. It had piercing green eyes and a leopard print. It remained for a few seconds then disappeared into the bush. Being naive and a dumb kid, I woke up from my dream thinking of how cool it was that I could have dreams like that. Fast forward 10 years and my family is taking a trip to see my grandmother in Canberra. At the time, my dad had recently purchased a new car, and would you believe it, it was precisely the exact same car in my dream, snorkel, bull bar, and all. This was the first trip we had gone on in this specific car. We were driving down the highway with the same endless expanse of bush, just like in my dream. It was picture perfect, as if the tiniest details were accurate in the dreamscape. It was at the sunup that we noticed that where exactly we were driving. My phone had recently died on the trip. Being a biology fanatic, I decided to look out the car's window to survey the land and enjoy the surrounding wildlife. I did this for about 5, maybe 10 minutes. I was about to look away when something caught my eye. I diverted my attention away, back from the Australian bush. There, just 20 meters away from the car, was the shape of a large cat running through the trees. I rubbed my eyes to make sure what I was seeing was actually true. It was. The shape soon emerged from the tree line for just a brief second. It was now 10 meters from the car and closing. This cat was speedy, with a leopard-like pattern and piercing green eyes. As it started to keep pace with the car, it ran on to the lane beside our vehicle on the left. As I got closer, my jaw almost ripped out of my mouth from how fast it dropped to the drawer. There, just mere meters from the car, was what I can only describe as a Smilodon. For those who do not know, a Smilodon is the official scientific taxation on the common umbrella term, saber-toothed cat. Now understand that a common misconception is that saber-toothed tigers existed. Instead, they're actually saber-toothed cats because they're not necessarily tigers. But I digress. 
From memory, the Smilodon was at least lengthwise the size of the car and as tall as the average man. It also had piercing green eyes and leopard patterning, sharp claws attached to the powerful muscular sleek arms, a stub for a tail, and two substantial razor-sharp sabers about 30 centimeters long. It kept pace with the car for a few seconds, however those mere seconds felt like hours. It let out a guttural, terrifying, primitive roar that shook the spine inside of me and sent ripples of dread through my freaking body. Its green eyes pierced me like sharp spears. I could feel it. It, it could sense my fear. When I thought it would ram the car off the road into the ditches and ravines below, it quickly disappeared into the tree line. I rubbed my eyes again and then saw nothing. I don't remember much after what happened after that. When I awoke the next day, I was in an unfamiliar room. We had stopped at a hotel near a country town for the night. My mother was beside me, praying I'd wake up. She noticed I was awake and hugged me while thanking God in Greek. I asked my mother what happened, and why we were here, and that's when she told me she found me passed out in the car and I would not wake up. I felt exhausted once again and fell back asleep. We checked out of the hotel the next day and continued the drive to Grandma's house. We spent two days there and came back home with that issue. However, years later, I'm in bed reading some articles. Something caught my eye. I clicked on an article in the recommended section. My eyes slowly widened as I read the article. The headline read, Biotech Engineering Company Colossal Dubs $15 Million into Funding the Mammoth Cloning Project. I read further down the article in disbelief. The article continued, However, the mammoth isn't the only prehistoric animal Colossal is resurrecting back from the dead. They also have reported on cloning several more species such as the thylacine, the dodo, and the smilodon. I started to get cold sweats and a wave of dizziness and nausea overwhelmed me as those memories of that bone-chilling morning came flushing back. I could hear the primitive roar of the smilodon. I could hear it in my ears all these years later. It, it's like recounting a haunting that you lived or something, it's kinda weird. I still get minor premonitions. Though they're minor, like a storm that happens on this date or something like that, they still have caused quite a bit of trouble in my life. I'm still scared of the capabilities my brain and the Lord have given me. But, despite all this, I still have unanswered questions. Was this a vivid hallucination? Did I actually encounter the Smilodon? What do you guys think? Hopefully, someone here will have the answer to my question. I have been wondering about this for about 36 years. When I was around 8 years old, I was with my mother at a grocery store. I looked up and saw something, but I still don't know what it was. The creature was my height or a little bit shorter. It had brown, rough skin, and its head was about one-fourth of the body. It had a very broad figure. It was a bit human-looking, but definitely not a human. It was dressed in human winter clothing and in bluish colors. The face was huge with a very big mouth, downturned into a sort of grumpy expression. I don't know what I saw, so I looked up at least five times to see if it was actually there, double-taking. I remember that because I was very scared of the number five for a long time afterward. The same goes for the color blue because the creature wore clothes in different shades. My mother really didn't notice anything unusual and got annoyed with me because I suddenly started behaving weirdly. She was tired and a bit stressed and wanted to go home herself. I didn't say anything to her because I usually kept my problems to myself. I had been googling this many times and trying to figure out what I saw, without any result. I've been listening to this show for years now and I still haven't heard anything similar. I have never seen any strange things after that. What do you think I saw all that time ago? There is something about the Finger Lakes that suggests the possibility of supernatural and mysterious things. Legends and stories abound of hauntings, spirit happenings, utopian communities, ancient ruins, inexplicable phenomena, extraterrestrial visits, and the occasional glimpse of even Sasquatch. Among the most intriguing stories are the numerous reported sightings in the deepest parts of the lake. An aquatic creature, a lake monster if you will. Each of the Finger Lakes has its own personality, of course. 
but the Lake Seneca and Cayuga seem to fit within a different, more mysterious category. Their waters are colder, their moods are darker, their waves are bigger. You can travel on boats to and from the sea to these two lakes, and their sheer size seems to hint at the possibility of ancient aquatic megafauna. Native Americans believed Seneca Lake to be a bottomless lake, with a monster that lived within its depths. Almost 40 miles long, deep, and one to three miles wide, the pitch black depths of the both hundreds of feet deeper than sunlight can penetrate descend to depths below sea level. Reports of monsters in Cayuga Lake were numerous, perhaps even routine in the 1800s. It can be inferred from a story from January 5, 1897 in an edition of the Ithaca Journal. Incredibly, the piece reported that a recent sighting marked the 69th consecutive year in which there was a confirmed encounter with the monster nicknamed Old Greeny. The story went on to recount that the member of the newspaper staff had been living in daily anticipation of Old Greeny's appearance and had refused reporting assignments that would have taken them near the lake because they were afraid of the monster. The 1897 incident was reported to have been by an Ithaca resident who was driving along the lake's eastern shore and saw what he knew must be the large, the long sea serpent. Of course, there were many people trying to debunk it as some sort of tramp or muskrat. Sporadic and isolated reports of the creature would continue until about 1929, when people began reporting not one, but two creatures sighted together along the lake's eastern shore. The creatures were described by witnesses as being 12 to 15 feet in length. It was speculated that they might be members of the Seneca Lake Sea Serpent family that found their way into the local waters through a subterranean channel, which is believed to exist between the two lakes. Legends of tunnels connecting Cayuga and Seneca Lakes have circulated for many, many years, which anyone with a rudimentary grasp of the notion of water seeking its own level knows could be possible. Occasional other reports of Old Greeny have certainly been made since then, including a 1974 attack in which a teenage boy apparently had his arm broken and bit by a large eel-like creature, and the local 1979 encounter by a professional diver of a submerged animal 30 to 35 feet in length. Still, all the reported sightings, save one, have been by one or two persons. The incident with the greatest number of witnesses, and therefore the most credible lake monster encounter, happened on the evening of July 14, 1899 on Seneca Lake. The side-wheeled steamboat Otetiani, named to evoke the region's Iroquois past, was traveling north toward Geneva from Watkins Glen with several dozen passengers at about 7 p.m. Sunset was at approximately 8.40, so there was plenty of daylight left, and it had been a sunny and seasonably warm high 79. Somewhere between Dresden on the west side of the lake and Willard on the east side, pilot Frederick Rose reported that approximately 400 yards ahead of the boat was what appeared to be an overturned boat. Captain Carlton Herodine examined the thing with his telescope, later describing its appearance as being 25 feet long with a very sharp bow and long narrow stern. Passengers began to gather. It was a group of some ostensibly credible witnesses, including two commissioners of public works, a police commissioner, the manager of the Geneva Telephone Company, and a geology professor. As Captain Herodine completed his inspection, the pilot signaled the engineer to slow down the boat. The steamboat approached to within 100 yards and lowered a boat to take a closer look. Suddenly, the object turned and began to move away. The captain immediately ordered a full speed ahead. As the thing was moving slowly, the steamboat gained on it easily. The object turned again, this time toward the steamboat, raising its head, looking in the direction of the boat and opening its mouth displaying two rows of sharp white teeth. Captain Herendine declared that he would ram the creature and take it alive, if possible. Otherwise, he would kill it and take it aboard or tow it to Geneva. This was the United States in 1899, when conservation of flora and fauna was still kind of fringe. Out west, the bison population, perhaps 10 million in 1850, had been reduced to fewer than 1,000. Passenger pigeons, numbering in the billions in 1860, were on the brink of extinction. 
and so the boat was turned so that the boat would approach the creature from the side at a ramming speed. The deck of the steamboat was crowded with passengers who were ordered by the captain to put on life preservers. According to the Geneva Gazette, every eye on deck was fixed on the monster and hardly a person was breathing normally. While the boat was yet some distance from it, the monster again looked at the boat, sank out of sight, and the boat passed over the spot where it had been. As the steamboat approached within 50 yards of the creature, the captain gave the order to turn the boat so that its paddle wheel would strike the creature midway between its head and tail. The boat went full steam ahead and struck the monster with enough impact that many of the passengers were thrown off their feet. The mortally wounded animal lay in the water next to the steamboat. It raised its head, gave a sound like a gasp, and lay quiet. Its spinal column had been broken and it was dead. Lifeboats were immediately lowered and lines were strung around the body. Passengers and crew tried to secure the carcass. In the end, though it proved too heavy or unwieldy and dropped into the water, sinking 600 feet to the bottom of Seneca Lake. The ship reached Geneva after dark and the passengers began to tell their stories of the incident. While all agreed that a monster had been seen, different versions of the length of the monster from 25 feet to as much as 90 feet strained the credibility of the accounts. The Rochester Herald said that Professor George R. Elwood, the geologist on board, who had been in one of the lifeboats trying to secure the body, gave what was considered the most careful and perhaps most trustworthy account. He thought it was a cladastis, an extinct marine lizard from the Mosasaur family that lived in what is now the United States until it disappeared from the fossil record at the end of the Cretaceous period, about 66 million years ago. Now, we can't let skepticism get the better of us. Considering that in December of 1938, a South African fisherman caught a coelacanth, which is a fish that was thought to have been extinct and disappeared from the fossil record at the end of the Cretaceous period, 66 million years ago. So it is entirely possible that this thing could have existed. Professor Elwood went on to describe the creature as about 25 feet long with a tail that tapered until within about 5 feet of the head which it broadened out and looked much more like a whale. The creature weighed about 1,000 pounds. Its head was perhaps four feet long and triangular. Its mouth was very long and it was armed with two rows of triangular white teeth as sharp as those as a shark, but in the shape more like that of a sperm whale. Its body was covered with a horny substance, which was much like the carapace of a terrapin as anything else of which I know. This horny substance was brown in color and of a greenish tinge. The belly of the creature, which I saw after the rope slipped and the carcass was going down, was cream white. Its eyes were round, like those of a fish, and it did not wink. For years now, what could it have been has been the question that has speculated around the area, and even the country, and now the world. It hardly seems likely that so many people could have imagined something so vivid if there had been nothing there. Lake Sturgeon, indigenous to both big lakes, can live to be as old as 100 years, grow to 9 feet long and 300 pounds. Their skin is like a shark-like dull gray. Eels are darker but smaller, not getting much longer than 5 feet. Muscalungi can also get over 5 feet long and weigh 70 pounds. Plus, they have rows of sharp teeth. None are apt to convince a boatload of people that they were in the presence of a 25-foot monster, though. It was suggested by cynics that the whole thing was a hoax perpetuated by the passengers and crew, which is also exceedingly unlikely. Dozens of people would have had to have kept that secret for the rest of their lives, while human nature suggests that no group larger than three people can be trusted to reliably keep a secret for a long weekend. The Geneva Historical Society can document at least 20 separate reported sightings of the Seneca Lake Monster. Most recently in 2013, Cayuga's Old Greenie has a Facebook page. Clearly the idea that Big Lakes harbor mysteries beyond our knowledge is one that is held stubborn and collective in our imagination. It's part of the charm of living in small towns, I would say, especially lake towns. These experiences occurred at Lake Gogabic in Michigan from 1994 to 1996. I've lived in Michigan all of my life and never been interested in moving anywhere else. My family is here. It is and always will be my home. And during the time span, I was accustomed to hiking along the side of the lake where the brush was thin enough to allow me to do so. 
There was some private property along the shoreline as well that I avoided by cutting through the woods and coming back toward the lake once I passed. I always wondered if people thought I was a bit creepy, just bumbling through the woods. But I did wear a backpack and hiking boots. I'm sure folks that did see me knew what I was doing. Anyway, in 1994, one Saturday morning, I woke up at about 5 when it was still dark out and got my stuff together. I packed some granola bars as I planned to have a peaceful breakfast on the edge of the lake while watching the sunrise. Nothing beats it. After a 30 minute drive, I was exactly where I wanted to be, under a rich canopy in the faint shadows cast by a rising sun. But something felt different. Something felt wrong. Now before I continue, you must know I had been walking in those woods and next to that lake at least 500 times. I've never once had an eerie feeling while I was out there. But that day, something was different. I felt like I was being watched. At least a dozen times I stopped to listen. I would look around to see no one or anything out of place. Maybe I was still tired or something. Well, I kept on walking, and no longer after, I swear I heard footsteps behind me again. I turned to see who it was and there was still no one there. The trees were still. There was no wind. I was alone. I started again walking toward the edge of the water. I was starving and ready to have a seat and start eating. And again those footsteps came from behind me. Who's there? I called out to the motionless forest that surrounded me. No one replied. Waiting for about 15 minutes I stood as calmly as I could. But to be honest I was starting to feel more and more uneasy by the second. After hearing nothing, I took a few steps toward a cozy looking rock by the bank and sat down. I peeled the wrappers from my breakfast and had at it, taking swigs of bottled water in between bites and whistling a tune here and there. What I didn't expect was to hear someone whistling back to me. I stopped, almost choking on my granola. My body was covered in goose flesh. As I slid around the rock to face the forest, there was still no one there. Now more curious than afraid, I drank another gulp of water and whistled again. Once more, after a few seconds, the same tune whistled back to me, plain as day. It was either my first time ever hearing an echo out on this lake, or someone hiding in the woods was trying to scare me. One more time, I whistled expecting to pinpoint exactly where this mimic cry was coming from. This time, the tune came from directly behind me. I fell forward off the rock and faced the direction it came from while crawling away backward. My heart was pounding out of my chest. All I was able to glimpse was a large splash in the water and the fleeting ripples thereafter. Without a moment of hesitation, I picked up my backpack and ran toward my truck. I didn't set out for Gogabik again for months. I was still spooked after this weird experience. Eventually, I did start my usual hikes again, and for the longest time, I didn't run into anything weird. One day in 1995 though, I did hear the footsteps again. But the moment I heard it, I turned tail and ran back to my truck. I was not about to chance it was something I couldn't even see. The final experience happened in the spring of 1996. This is the experience that confirmed that whatever was happening wasn't echoes, animals in the woods, or some prankster trying to get me. The following experience left me with nightmares still to this day. I had figured that if I just avoided that side of the lake, it'd be okay. I'd be fine. So this time, I parked my truck on literally the opposite side, and that's a big deal. Gogabik is the largest natural lake in Michigan, so I was miles away from where that other weirdness had happened. That day I had brought a sketch pad and a set of colored pencils. I had gotten into sketching scenery recently and using that medium really helped me relax and forget my problems. At least for a moment. I was being extremely quiet. It's not like I was trying to be as quiet as possible, I was just focused and still when the footsteps came out of nowhere, those all too familiar footsteps. I looked ever so slowly in the direction they were coming from. I expected to see nothing. For so long I've been hearing these footsteps and for so long I've witnessed them coming from nowhere. Not today. No, this time I saw something and I can say for sure this was no person. It was standing at the edge of the water, looking out over the lake. It looked hunched over and thin. Skin was pale as the moon. Just the sight of it made my skin crawl. My heart seemed to stop. I prayed and I prayed to my head, hoping this thing would not see me. There was no telling how long that thing had been walking over there for. But, God, even hunched it was so tall. It stood at least three feet over me. 
I did not want to catch this thing's attention. I stayed put. I didn't move, and I barely breathed. For at least 30 minutes, the creature didn't move as it continued to stare at the water. Finally, it walked slowly forward, taking massive steps into the shallow water before the top of its head disappeared into it. I should have drawn it, but I was too scared to move, and I couldn't make out too much of its face. I continued to sit and sit, waiting and breathing slowly. Underwater or not, it was too soon to start running. I waited another half hour just to be safe. My ass started to ache, and the rock underneath me did not feel good after a while. Eventually, I called it. It was time to get the hell home. ASAP. I slid my sketchbook and pencil case into my bag and stood up. I turned toward the trail. There it was. Not two yards in front of my face, it stood staring at me. It was towering over me, yet still standing in the water. The face... God, that face. I finally got a good look at it. It was black, with sunken pits where its eyes should have been. Black, sunken pits where its eyes should have been. There was no nose, just wrinkled pink and pale, almost disgusting blue skin, and where the mouth was meant to be was just an absence of anything. With its lacking eyes, it faced me. It stared at me. I slowly backed away, and yet its empty gaze followed me. I had no other choice. I had to run. It reached out to me with a long, thin finger that had no nails. Before they could reach me, I broke into my fastest possible sprint. I did not turn around. I did not glance over my shoulder. The moment I reached my truck, I opened the door, jumped in, and sped away. Since that day, I have not gone back to Lake Gogobic, and I never planned to. Twenty years have passed, and I'm an old man now, and I'm still very much afraid of that place. I do not know what I saw. I don't think I ever will. But I have passed these stories down to my kids and my kids' kids in hopes that they will have some sort of idea of what is out there. No matter how smart people think they are, we do not know everything about our planet. There are creatures that elude us. Believe me, I came face to face with one. My grandparents own a large plot of land in central Missouri, and they have held the land for around 40 years now. I have been to that farm over 10 times, and every time I go, I always get this terrifying feeling that something is watching me, like there's always something behind my back. I have also had many strange encounters there that are downright bizarre. My first encounter with whatever the hell this thing is was when I was around the age of nine. We had brought our dog named Spot to the farm. He was a silver lab who I loved dearly. I explored in the forest behind the house, enjoying the summer breeze when my dog started growling. A deep, sinister growl that I've never heard him make. I turned around quickly to see what he was growling at, but could see nothing but forest along with trees and more trees. While my eyes were scanning the area where my dog was growling, some animal shot out of the brush so fast I could barely see what it was, and before I knew it, it was gone. I sat there for what felt like an eternity absolutely flabbergasted by what I had just witnessed. From what I could see of it, it looked like a coyote but the speed of which it was moving was insane. It moved at like 90 miles an hour and made almost zero noise. But the creepiest part was is that the place it jumped out of didn't even make an imprint or any sort of footprint. I looked all over to find some sort of evidence that this thing even existed. Shocked by what I witnessed, I just decided that that was enough and went back inside the house. My second encounter happened when I was 10 years old. I was visiting the place like usual and I was getting that feeling that I was being watched. The first day was normal and nothing too creepy happened. I was just trying to spend as much quality time with my family. But when night came, that's when things started happening. I was trying to sleep in a twin bed that was shared by my mom's brother when he used to live there. When I heard tapping, not tiny little taps, but loud taps, almost like banging, coming from the direction of the window. I slowly sat up and looked up at the window, but there was nothing that I could see, so I assumed it was just some sort of animal. Five minutes passed and the tapping had stopped, and I was drifting off to sleep when boom, this is not a tap, but a slam, a loud slam directly into the window. I'm not talking like a hit. It sounded as if something massive hit the window with all of its force. I shot up so quickly that I nearly passed out. I decided enough was enough and grabbed a flashlight in the drawer and shined it out the window. There was nothing. Ten seconds passed and there was still nothing. 
I was about to go crawl into my mom's bed when I heard a loud screech. A screech that was not achievable by any human. So loud it pierced the quiet, peaceful summer night. I cannot put into words what it sounded like. It was dark and horrible, but I still remember it to this day. I froze. Unable to move muscles, I was so scared. I was sitting there still as a statue, petrified by what I heard. That's when my instincts kicked in and they told me to run into my mom's room, which I did. For some reason, I didn't wake her up. I just cuddled up next to her and didn't sleep the entire night. All I could do is think of that sound, that horrible, bloody screech. My next encounter was when I was at the age of 13, so three years later. I was back at my grandparents just enjoying the time like I usually do and my grandparents suggested that we go deer watching. I agreed because I had been doing this for as long as I could remember and I had never had an issue or creepy experience while doing so. It was a relaxing and extremely fun. At around 6 or 7 p.m., we decided to go in the most eastern pasture because that's usually where we spotted the most deer. 30 minutes passed and we had seen a few deer, but not as much as we usually do. But then, this is where the real scary stuff begins. I get that feeling again, that dreadful feeling that something is there watching us in the shadows. But this time, it's a lot more intense than it ever has been before. Like, it's right up behind me, but when I look, it's never there. But this time, it appears that my grandpa feels the same presence as me, too. Just to let all of you know, my grandpa is a very laid-back individual, always joking and having a laugh. The only time I've ever seen him very serious is when my great-uncle died a couple of years ago. So when I start feeling that I'm being watched, my grandpa goes from a happy and laid-back guy with an expression of joy to a very serious and alert expression. He gripped the wheel so tight his knuckles turned white and was constantly looking around to make sure something was not following us. He then made a massive U-turn out of nowhere and started heading back to the house. I asked him what he was doing, and he replied, We're heading back to the house. The tone of his voice was cold like he had witnessed someone being murdered. At this point, he was gripping the wheel even harder and was absolutely going pedal to the metal full speed back to the house. I decided not to ask any questions until we got back to the house, which we did in no time at all. Once we were there, he rushed me into the house, constantly checking his back to make sure nothing was there. When we were inside, he closed and locked the door tight. His behavior was very alarming, and it really shocked me to my core. I decided that all the stuff I had witnessed was enough and only asked him one question. What the hell is going on here? When I said that, he looked at me and gave me a cold expression and said, I have some things I need to explain to you. We then sat down for 30 minutes, and he explained that whatever this thing was was living on his property and has been here since the day he moved in, and he and my mother experienced the same thing. He explained that he has seen whatever this thing is countless times, and it does not like new visitors, hence why I was experiencing all of these problems. He told me about all these things that he had witnessed and experienced, and they seemed to have been pretty much what was happening to me. He then told me that he knew what was going to happen to me, and we were always watching to make sure I never got hurt because he knew this creature better than anyone else. We talked about this for some time. It was now late, and he decided that I couldn't sleep alone, so he slept with me and my mom. We luckily left the next morning, and I have not been back since. This encounter, it really wasn't an encounter, really shook me up though, and my grandparents have now put their farm up for sale and are looking to move. This is, this is a very scary time for everybody because recently we had a horse that we found three 10 inch gashes down in their side. Something was clawing at it, trying to get it through the fence. Also around the same time, my grandparents adopted a dog and named it Panda. Panda was a Jack Russell Terrier who was the age of five. A couple of days later, he was found dead with deep puncture wounds into his body and his neck slashed up. They ruled it out as a bobcat or a lion but I also think otherwise. I don't know what the hell this thing is, but something tells me that it's no good. Thanks for listening to these creepy and downright strange cryptid encounter horror stories. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. As stories like yours help keep this show going on a daily basis. Don't forget to slap that like button silly if you enjoyed tonight's episode. 
The more likes and comments this video gets, the more YouTube promotes it, and that helps us out a ton. Don't forget to subscribe if you're new, and turn on notifications so you don't miss a video. I upload them daily, Monday through Friday. If you're on the go, and you don't have YouTube Premium, but still want to download and listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you are, you can download them absolutely free from Spotify, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, and pretty much everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. I appreciate you guys as always for supporting the Swamp the way you do. Be sure to check me out over on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all the good social medias, and I'll see you all soon with another creepy episode.